Okay, uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, sorry for messing up the YouTube a little bit just now. Hopefully everyone can see it um, properly now. Um, so this is Coffee and Code for February 2021, back after our Christmas break. And um, I'm very, very happy to invite today uh, Matilda Orslin from um, NGI at SciLife Lab, the National Genomics Infrastructure, um, working in, in Uppsala um, and working amongst many other things with a, with a project called Arteria, which is something I've personally been eager to kind of find out more about um, for, for a long time now. So I'm quite excited about today's talk. Um, I'll, I'll let Matilda give more of a, an introduction um, for herself. But basically, uh, if you have any questions, um, please put them into the Zoom chat, or if you're watching on YouTube, put them onto the YouTube app, and uh, I will field those questions at the end. Um, Renuka, who normally runs the Coffee and Code, is unfortunately um, ill today, so we've had to jump in last minute, which is partly why it's been slightly chaotic. Um, so I hope she'll be better and she'll be back uh, next month. Uh, as always, if you're interested in giving a talk for Coffee and Code, please do uh, let us know on, the, on Slack on the Coffee and Code channel. Right, without that anymore, I will uh, stop my screen share and I'll, I'll pass over to Matilda and let her tell us all about Arteria Project. Yes, thank you, Phil. Let's see if I get the screen up. It's, uh, you can see my screen, right? Yep, that looks Anyone? good. Yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes, so I'm uh, uh, Matilda Slin. I work as a mathematician at the Snip and Seek Technology Platform. Uh, that's part of uh, National Genomics Infrastructures. That's part of Scilab Lab. That's, that's a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I'm here to talk about the Arteria project. And uh, uh, it is used at our uh, facility to automate uh, sequencing data processing. Uh, and I can mention that I am not the one of the creators, but the, uh, when I started at working at this platform, I think I was the first user uh, of, of using the system. And then I became yeah, a developer, and now I'm, yeah, you can say, the main developer at our platforms for the Arteria project. So the Arteria project is kind of like an old friend for me. Um, but yeah, let's get going. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background. Why we, why do we need an automation system at the sequencing facility? Uh, and what did we use for this before Arteria? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the idea behind the Arteria project and uh, yeah, how it works. And then I'm going to go into our implementation of this like a framework, and I'm going to show you, uh, have a short demo and show you what it looks like to work with. And then we're going to go, to, go into some future plans uh, that we have, or that I wish to do, my wish list, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, so let's continue. Yeah, so I uh, work at a sequencing facility. And our mission is to provide sequencing as a service for researchers. Uh, and here I wish uh, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit how this how this flow works. Uh, and this is a really brief overview, uh, and also my point of view. So uh, there's a lot of other stuff happening, but uh, but basically it works like this. So we have a researcher, maybe named Anna, and she has a uh, she wants to uh, know the DNA sequence and sequences in her, uh, like a, maybe a tumor sample that she has. Uh, so she can send this to our lab, uh, and then we will do some uh, cool chemistry stuff uh, to prepare it to be read in one of these uh, sequencing machines. Uh, and I'm not going to go into, into anything about how this uh, technology works. Uh, but you can you can Google like because we have a brand called Illumina. If you Google like Illumina sequencing by synthesis, uh, you will find some cool videos about it. Um, but uh, but so this machine uh, reads these biological samples, and then this biological data is turned into like digital data, 
that is written to our servers. Uh, so this is like, yeah, big, like huge files with like, um, yeah, data that contains these like uh, ATs and Gs, like the DNA sequences. Um, so, uh, so this, yeah, like I said, this is like huge amounts of data. So we need to, we need to like get a, um, have a flow in the processing because otherwise we would fill up our service. Uh, so we need to, there are a number of things we need to do with this data before we can send it back to the researchers. We need to uh, convert it to a format that's usable for them. So like a universal format that's used by everyone. And we need to uh, do some kind of quality control uh, to make sure that nothing, that we did something wrong back here. Um, and then also we need to send the data for archiving so that we can access it later. And then sometimes we might, might want to do some uh, further like bioinformatic analysis of this data. And then we need some more computer power to do this. So then we need to send this data to HPC cluster. So we use, we have our own clusters uh, at Upmax. Uh, and from here, when the data is uh, ready, can either be this more the raw DNA sequences or this more uh, processed uh, data. We make it available for the researchers that can uh, download it. So that's just to get an overview of what we have to do. Uh, and, uh, um, and you could do this manually, like wait for the data to come here and then plug into the server and do some commands and like do all of this run or a lot of scripts and then uh, upload it manually. But uh, when you start to get like, when you start to run these machines uh, a lot, like multiple times a week, then it's not really doable. And it does take some, when, there are, when the data sizes are really big, it does take some time uh, to process it. So we can't really just sit and wait for it to be, to be finished. Uh, so we really need a way to automate this. Um, uh, so what, what the, pipe, the platform had in the beginning was a pipeline for doing this. And it was a, a collection of Perl scripts and modules tied together by a bash script. And uh, so this was when I started at the platform for uh, like, yeah, six years ago, this was what we used. Uh, and the, the way uh, the way I knew that a sequencing run was ready was that that a person from the lab came into my office and like, gave me a paper with some info like, OK, there's a new sequencing run ready. Uh, it's on this server and it has this run ID. And then uh, with this paper in front of me, I would then log into the server and start this uh, bash script. Uh, and um, yeah, so this bash script contained, like, yeah, had uh, calls to these different Perl scripts. And if something went wrong, on, uh, for example, the third step, then I would have to uh, go into the script, like maybe change some parameters on that line and then go in and <laughs> comment, the, comment out the first steps and then run it again. So it was super, uh, like, yeah, a lot of manual intervention. Uh, but, it, but it did work pretty well, I must say. Uh, and I think that's what, what was why the platform used it for so long. Uh, but the person that developed it, uh, he was long gone when I started working uh, at the platform. I don't know when he left, but yeah. But when I started working, basically no one had a really uh, was super familiar with this pipeline and it started to become this big legacy code that nobody wanted to touch. And also we were getting uh, new sequencing machines that were producing more data faster. So we, were, so we really had to like, uh, like make things more automated. Uh, so that's when uh, some of my colleagues uh, Johan Dahlberg, Stena Surlaksson, Johan Hermansson and Pons Larsson sat down and like started to sketch up some ideas of what, what could be the next, uh, the next tool uh, for like automate this for us. Um, and to, to not like reinvent the wheel, they, 
looked for existing uh, tools that are out there, like open source, and they found Stackstorm, uh, uh, which is an event-driven automation engine uh, that works uh, against this um, with this event-driven model. Uh, so basically, an event happens, it is sensed by a sensor, which then triggers some kind of rule, uh, and then the rule starts actions that should be performed based on this, uh, yeah, about what, what is sensed um, uh, in the event. So uh, the Arteria project is uh, based on this Stackstorm module uh, and has uh, three conceptual levels. So first on the uh, top level, we have this orchestration level, and this is basically Stackstorm. Uh, so it's about sensing the events and making the decisions about what's going to happen. Uh, and this is also where the users uh, interact with the system uh, to, to get to know what's happening down here. Uh, and then we have the uh, process level where you model processes. Uh, so this can be, yeah, for example, syncing data to the, uh, to the HPC cluster or sending it for being archived. Uh, and it might contain like, uh, yeah, multiple steps that you turn into a, a, yeah, a workflow. Uh, and for this uh, use, a uh, workflow engine is used, uh, and it used to be Mistral, which is an open source uh, workflow engine, but the Stackstorm has actually dropped support for that. So that's why I've added this little, this is a, a picture from the paper. Uh, so I just wanted to update it. So, so now if you're gonna do write workflows in Stackstorm, you should use their Stackstorm's own workflow engine called Orquesta. Uh, but that's just a side note. Uh, but then on the lower level, we have uh, the place where the action actually happens. Uh, so it is here that you, uh, you define different actions that should be executed. And it can be shell commands, or it can be uh, running uh, Python scripts or whatever. But what's uh, special for the Ethereum projects is this, uh, is to utilize these microservices uh, to try to for specific actions that you want to perform, you you can you should make microservices that does them for you, and that has this really simple HTTP interface, so that you basically can send a request and say start doing what you should do or stop doing it, <laughs> or yeah, uh, and they the rule there I guess is that they should be they should do basically one thing, but they should do it really good. And it should be kind of uh, like a quite general. So it shouldn't be super specific to your uh, to your needs so that like uh, other people can use it. Uh, but yeah, but so, so by using this module and like uh, having uh, these um, actions like separated, you can use them as building blocks to build your own uh, workflow that you need at your uh, facility. Uh, and it was actually this system that um, uh, that enables us, because they, I think Stainer might have to uh, correct me here, but I think they started working on this like when I started working at the platform like 2015. And I, I checked some of our documents and we started using Ethereum in the year after. And we, we were able to do this quite quick because we, we didn't have to drop the old pipeline, like all of it at once, because we were able to keep some of the stuff uh, while using like Stackstorm as our, as the, as the ruler that uh, makes the decision, we could still make, uh, use some of these Perl scripts for making uh, like uh, these QZ reports or yeah, checking that, um, certain quality control uh, criteria were met, stuff like that. So I think that was really, really successful. So we didn't have to build like all of the things at once. We could just phase 
uh, phase them in. Uh, so now we are, I think it was maybe two years ago, we were totally rid of the old Sisyphus system. Uh, so it took a while. Um, yes, um, yeah, but then I want to show you that you can find the Acheria project on GitHub as an organization. Uh, and here you can find the, uh, the microservices. Uh, but you can also find what's actually what you implement in Stackstorm. Uh, so uh, a pack is uh, a Stackstorm pack is like an extension to Stackstorm or like a module that you where you can add custom actions and rules and sensors uh, according to your needs. Uh, and I should mention that the Arteria packs here, this is not what we use at our facility. This is just a, like a proof of concept and uh, to serve as a maybe starting point and a tutorial. And there's actually a really good, the Dream is, is quite uh, good and yeah, you can follow a tutorial here to get to set this up and try to running get like a, an environment up with Stackstorm and trying to run some workflows using this. So I really recommend doing that if you're interested. Uh, and yeah, and then I also wanted to mention just like I said, the, the event driven uh, model. So you can actually see it in here that if you have these folders here that where you define the uh, the different actions and the rules and the sensors, what they should do. So that's essentially what a pack is. Um, yeah, and uh, I can also mention that all of this is written in, uh, like the definitions of an action is written in YAML, and also uh, the workflow also, also has this like YAML format. So it's quite, it's quite easy to read for a human uh, being. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, then I just want to show you the paper that came out. It took a little while, it wasn't uh, accepted at first, but uh, if you Google Arteria and Giga Science, you can find it. I really recommend reading it. Uh, then I want to move on to like showing you how it, how it actually works, or at least try to show you. Um, so uh, in this picture, we have uh, have a server here where we have installed Stackstorm and that has the sensor, uh, like the pack that we have defined. Uh, so this is what we call uh, at there was like the Arteria master, the one <laughs> that rules them all. Uh, and down here we have the sequencer and this is the server where the sequencing data is written to. Uh, and it is to this server that we install the microservices. So for example, a, a Terry run folder. So I should mention run folder is what we call a sequencing run. Uh, I will probably say it a lot. Uh, yeah, but so, so the purpose of this uh, microservice is to, uh, to keep track of the status of a specific run folder. Like, is it ready to be processed? Has it an error occurred or uh, is it done? Um, so in our sensor, then we we define that. Okay, so every five minutes we want to check is the sequencing run ready, and then the microservice will check that for us. Uh, and most of the time it will say nope, nothing new here. Uh, but sometimes uh, you will get yes, here it is. You get all the info that is needed to start uh, processing of it. Uh, so then the sensor has uh, detected an event. So then it will dispatch a trigger. Uh, and we call, so in this case, we call this trigger the like, run folder ready. And then we have to find a room that waits for such a trigger. Uh, and when that trigger appears, then uh, a certain workflow should be started. Um, yes, and then the workflow starts and it's a, it's a collection of actions that we have defined that it should do and maybe some workflows even. And uh, what happens during this um, 
uh, workflow is that there can be some actions that call other microservices to, to perform uh, actions on this data. Uh, for example, we have a microservice that runs BCL to FastQ, which is an Illumina software for converting this uh, raw binary format to a more usable format for the, for the users or researchers. Uh, but it doesn't have to do with the data itself. It can be uh, steps that include gathering more information. Uh, for example, we can query our limb system to maybe, okay, what kind of run is this? Oh, it's this uh, super special run. Uh, then we should run this microservice with uh, some specific parameters. Uh, and it can, but then it can also be actions that are acting directly on the server because it's built in, in Stackstorm to do like this, for example, shell commands remotely. So you can just, uh, so there are ready made actions. So you just have to specify the host and then like echo hello, and then it will perform, be performed on this server. Uh, but mostly uh, we use uh, like a Python plugin, so you can you can define uh, actions in Python uh, scripts. Uh, so that's mainly what we use for stuff that we don't put in microservices. Uh, yes, I think that was all I wanted to show you here. And I should also mention that, like I said, one to rule them all. This is just one, but the sensor. The way we have set up the center is that it will uh, query this uh, round folder status on a lot of servers and then workflows will be started like in parallel uh, if, if, yeah, if multiple round folders are ready on different servers. Okay, but so now we have a workflow going here, uh, but we want to be able to query it. Um, or like, yeah, what was to monitor it? What was happening here? Uh, so Stackstorm has uh, two interfaces. Uh, so uh, it has a web UI and a command line client. And at our uh, facility, we have mainly used the command line client. Uh, it, it's because mainly because the web UI is, some functionality is missing from it. Uh, plus, I think it was even worse when we started using Stackstrom, so we have no real tradition of using it. But I am going to show it to you now. Uh, so, let's see. Yeah, so this is basically what it looks. So you can see here for different dates, you can see all the executions that have been performed on the server. Uh, and I can also say that this is our like test uh, server. This is why you will see a lot of failed stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, but so I just want to show you here. So this is uh, the NGI UU workflow. That is our like, main processing uh, workflow. Uh, and if you click it like this, you can get a lot of information, like status of it. It gets a like a unique execution ID. And then you can use a trace tag because every workflow, like every invocation of an action or a workflow gets a specific trace tag. Uh, and you can specify that, like add a custom trace tag. Otherwise this will be something unique. Uh, so what we do is for all of these uh, processing actions that we run, we add the run ID of the sequencing run as a, as a trace tag. Then we can use this to get, for a specific sequencing run, we can get all of the actions that has been performed uh, to that sequencing run. So that's super smooth. And that's actually something you can't filter on in this uh, interface. So here you can see, you can filter to see a specific uh, action type, stuff like that, but you can't really uh, filter on this trace tag. Uh, and you can also see here, you can see what triggered this uh, uh, workflow. And you can see, yeah, in this case, it was the sensor that saw that the run was ready. And then it triggered this rule. And then you can see all the uh, 
uh, parameters that was used. We have a lot of parameters for this workflow. And uh, uh, then you can see there's a rewrite button. This is also a reason why we not we don't use this web interface that much. Uh, it's because the reruns, uh, it's kind of buggy, uh, but it, it works for some actions, I think. Uh, let's see if I have something. Yeah, so here we have a workflow that adds analysis tickets to uh, our, uh, to Jira. Uh, which is our like yeah where we organize our work tasks uh, so i thought maybe i could i don't think i think it's gonna fail again but i just wanted to show you what it can look like uh, so now i've started an action and you can see that it's running here uh, yeah so maybe we don't have to wait for this but yeah you get like instant uh, an instance uh, status of what's happening here, and then you can uh, start actions from scratch here. Uh, so this is our uh, no here snips in fact this is the actions that we have defined. But then you can also use like some core uh, actions, for example, running echo. Uh, Locally. Uh, yeah, and then I just want to show you the rules here because this is actually a quite nice thing with Stackstrom, I think. Uh, because uh, if we, for example, on a Monday, we say, okay, we're going to have maintenance on Monday and we want to make sure that nothing is running that time. Because this, uh, uh, like our standard processing worker, it can take some time, especially when we get this. Uh, when we are running uh, the sequencing machine with this huge, uh, uh, yeah, there, there are these like, it's a, it's a mode where you get a lot of data. Uh, so then it could be that stuff are running on Monday when we really want to like update the server or something. Uh, so what we can do then is just to go into the rule interface here and just, yeah, so the normal mode is that it's enabled and we can just Oh, on Friday, uh, we can just disable it because then we know that nothing will be started during the, uh, the weekend. Uh, and I think this, uh, yeah, this is super smooth and it makes it easy to work with. So we don't, otherwise, I guess we would have like, would have to like turn off the, the stack storm entirely or something like that to really make sure that nothing is running. So having this layer is uh, really great. Um, yeah, and then I just wanted to show you. Uh, let's see, the command line interface is quite yeah similar. Uh, so what I did here before you like a TV chef is to prepare an authentication token, but I don't need to do that now. Uh, so now I will get. Uh, so this is essentially the same view as the history tab in the web UI. So I get, you can see uh, some timestamps here and see what uh, workflows and actions has been uh, run on the server. Then you can get more information by this. So let me see here. Yeah, here I actually ran some test. Uh, low cupping code. <laughs> So you can see, yeah, it's basically the same thing, like the status and yeah. Um, yes, and you can also see the so here you can also see all the rules that are enabled or, or disabled. Uh, yeah, so this is mainly like the uh, the interface that we work with, or the bioinformaticians work with, that uh, that take care of the, the the sequencing run processing at our facility. Uh, yes, I think maybe that's all I want to show here. So. Um, 
Yeah, so what you saw there uh, was our implementation of the Ethereum packs called the Sneak Stick packs. Uh, and the, the, just to summarize that standard processing workflow that we have is that it runs PCL to false queue. Uh, we do some quality control, uh, make uh, quality control reports that sync the data to uh, Max. Uh, we can. Oh God, no! Uh, I think I'm, yeah, I'm lying here. We don't deliver data here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so but we archive data and all of this stuff, except the sync to FMAX, we actually do with microservices. So it's just called to different uh, microservices. Uh, but we do deliver data to researchers in another workflow. Uh, so, yes, and then I just wanted to mention that uh, all the things that we have in our packs is not only to do with like the actual sequencing data, it's um, a lot of other stuff. For example, we have some uh, weekly tasks for removing data. This was actually something I put a lot of time on doing when I started to work at the platform, just logging into different servers and removing data. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's so great that it's autom automated now. It makes me so happy because we, we get an email when stuff had, has been like removed and I get so happy when I see it. Um, and we also use it to make, uh, yeah, automate, automatically make year tickets based, based on information that we have in the link system and uh, much more. And I guess this is stuff you could have in your, uh, like in a cron tab uh, to make sure these things are done weekly, but we can put them like in, we can define it in a rule to, to do this every, yeah, once uh, every week. And then we get like this great overview. We get everything in the same place. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, easy to, to know what's going on. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. And then I want to mention that this, uh, this Nipsic packs is, uh, we have them on our local hosted GitLab server. So they're not publicly available, fortunately. Uh, and it's not to keep them secret. It's, um, it's that we we move them there. We used to have them on GitHub, uh, but we use them to we, we move them to our Git, own GitLab server because we wanted to utilize some uh, continuous integration and uh, deployment tools that uh, the GitLab has. So we have this like build server so that we can uh, deploy uh, stuff automatically with just a push of a button. So we don't need like an admin to with Ruth's access to, to do this stuff. Uh, and yeah, it is, it's really like improved our, uh, our turnaround time for like developing and uh, testing and uh, like making new releases. Uh, yes. So then I'm gonna to move on to some like future plans. And <laughs> we'll start with the all to do's. I think this is mentioned in the paper also that was written two years ago. Uh, so all of the services, I mean, most of the services are still in, uh, written in Python 2, which is no good uh, since this reached end of life for quite a long time now. Um, and also we would like to add HTTPS support to all services to make sure like the, the communication is encrypted. It's not that much of a problem for us right now because we run our microservices in this like a uh, sealed off environment uh, that not everyone can reach, but still it's like, yeah, it's something we really would like to have. Uh, but it's mostly a research pro problem. We haven't had like enough developers to work on all this stuff because we have, I mean, we have other stuff to do too, but yeah, I hope we get around to do it. Uh, not too uh, far in the future. Uh, and this is something that at least I would like to do. Um, I would like to make some parts or the whole repo. I think we could do that, uh, make it publicly available. Because I think even though there are some tasks that are really like tied into our facility and how we have set up our limb system, for example, I think a lot of it could be usable to other people. And maybe it's actually part that we should turn into a microservice instead. Uh, 
had to I had to look into that. But anyhow, um, I think that even if you don't, if you can't use everything in a pack, you can still install it and uh, use only the actions that you need. Uh, since it's this like, yeah, uh, it's so modular, modular like that. So I still think it would be good if we put made it uh, open source again. Uh, and internally, uh, we have also looked at the, because, I mean, a, down, a downside with using all of these microservices is that it's quite uh, a struggle when we're going to deploy because we might have to make sure that all of the microservices are running. Uh, uh, so we use Ansible for that. Uh, so we can just run a playbook and make sure everything is uh, deployed. Uh, but now we have uh, considered setting up uh, a GitLab repo where we where we mirror all where we have all the services of some module so that we also get a good overview of what which versions we are using of each service and then we can deploy it through CI/CD. One thing I would also like to do like put everything all of the microservices like in a Docker container or something like that so that you have everything in a package. Uh, but yeah, so this is not, yeah, that is not something really have a plan for right now, but I think that's something everyone wants. <laughs> so we just have to put, yeah, make time for it. Um, yes, so thanks for listening. Um, I actually found this uh, slumbering Arteria product channel in the Silent Lab Slack. So maybe you can write there if you want to know more or collaborate. Uh, and you can also contact me at uh, yeah this email address. So yeah, now I think I'm gonna stop talking and <laughs> let you ask some questions. Let's see, I'm gonna find the chat. Thank you very much for that talk. That was fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, got small children running around my ankles, but I'll try. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, Johannes on YouTube says um, that this uh, looks great. Uh, the web interface looks nice to backtrace what's happened during a specific day. You have the same type of history tracing in the CLI and command line interface. Uh, yes, I would say. Uh, I mean, yeah, but it, yeah, it's a bit complicated to get the same like summary for a specific day. But you can yeah, like use like parameters to like make sure that you only see uh, executions for a certain day. Um, but yeah, that's that I would say is much easier to get in the web interface actually. Um, I've got another question from Alice. Uh, are you able to use this on the cluster? Is it running on the cluster or is the master node able to log in via SSH? Uh, we are actually, yeah, we are running uh, microservices on our cluster. Uh, so that's, so we're not, we're not logging in through SSH uh, to the cluster because they are, it's really, it's this uh, cluster for sensitive data. So I don't think we're actually allowed to do that but we can export this uh, expose these ports so that we co can communicate with the microservices on uh, on our cluster so actually we have for example a delivery microservice running there to make sure that we can yeah so, so we so the data get like staged and delivered to Gerus, which is like a uh, yeah maybe you all know it uh, but yeah it's a it's a way to uh, to retrieve data from Bookmax, basically. Um, we've got a question from, from Warren here. Um, how does Stackstorm handle fault tolerance? Uh, so how easily does Stackstorm recover from a system crash or if a microservice goes down while pro processing uh, a user? Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't yeah, I mean, if it's, um, if the server is uh, like 
rebooted or something, it's it started up again. I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, and the same goes for our uh, microservices. Yeah, we have set them up so that they can, uh, I think that, that is something you have to set up manually, but uh, they should be started up again when a, when a system is rebooted. Uh, and it, it is, yeah, I mean, Stackstorm doesn't really like have any control of the how the microservices are running per se, but uh, it is possible to, uh, this is in, built in like retry uh, so that you can, you can always specify, okay, if you don't get an answer, you can try again. Uh, but I, you can't really start up a service from the Stackstorm interface. Uh, I want, I hope that's an uh, answer to that question. Okay, brilliant. Um, if you have no other questions, then um, we can call it day for day. Um, there's hopefully everyone who's watching as part of the Scilab Lab Slack, in which case uh, jump onto the Coffee and Code channel if you think of a question after this or if you're watching this um, later in the day and we're not live anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you can find us over there to ask more questions. Otherwise, uh, thank you very, very much for your time. It was a great talk. And, uh, and uh, we'll see everyone next month. Yeah, thank you.